Good evening. Six months ago, confidential files were uncovered in the National Archive deta detailing how babies were sent abroad for adoption in the 50s and the 60s. This morning, the Department of Foreign Affairs said it will make public 1,000 documents on this controversial subject. This afternoon, the Archdiocese of Dublin announced that they would do the same. Tonight's primetime is a special inquiry into the secret baby trail that took 2,000 Irish infants to America. The programme was made without the benefit of official files, which although requested repeatedly, were unavailable. But these files won't help any of the people who are trying to trace long-lost relatives. They are policy files only and contain no personal information. Mike Malott now reports. I handed over my child to an aunt, and I don't remember seeing anyone else in the room except an aunt taking my child out of my arms. Your child is just so traumatic. I was alone and I just walked out onto the street. It was dreadful. I was so devastated and so, so, um, in bits, so thin, drawn. Anyway. like yesterday. Mary Cunningham's story is disturbing, but sadly not uncommon. For in Ireland in the 50s and 60s, nearly 30,000 babies were born to unmarried mothers whom society shunned. But Mary's baby was destined for a different fate than most, as one of 2,000 or so infants sent for adoption to the United States. A new start, perhaps, in the land of opportunity, but this unseen migration was not all good news. Mary had her baby Kenneth in the Sacred Heart Convent in Cork, but she didn't have him long. I was told, there is a bundle of clothes, put them on your child. You're going on the train to Dublin to give over your child for adoption. You have parents while you're in America. I got on that train. My little baby in my arms was shawl around her and I had a bottle. And um, these two ladies helped me to change the child because I, I, I don't think I was able to go. I just cried my whole way up to Dublin. That was the last time I saw him for 33 years. Leesburg, Virginia, 40 miles west of Washington, D.C. My name is Kevin, but I haven't always been Kevin. I was born Kenneth Cunningham. I was in an orphanage in Ireland, and I flew over on a, a jumbo jet brought over by a stewardess who handed me over to my mom, Edith. I've always known I've been adopted. I'm, uh, all my life, I've, I've lived knowing that I have one, my parents here in America, and there's a woman out there somewhere in Ireland that gave me up. Like Kevin Bates, most adoptees eventually want to discover their roots. For those who went to America, the answer may lie in over 2,000 recently uncovered government files. It was a surprising revelation. Only a handful of people had known about this infant exodus, but how it began and who was behind it was still not made clear. Like her son Kenneth, Mary Cunningham's name has changed. In 1962, seven months after giving birth, she married Michael Garrity. Michael was Kenneth's natural father. It was not at all unusual, in fact, for a couple to get married after their first child had gone for adoption. Secrecy and shame dictated their behaviour. I couldn't have told my mother. No way could I have told my mother. My mother was very... Uh, religious, very religious Catholic woman and I was an only girl out of with three brothers and she had protected me all her life. Now if I came home and told her I was pregnant, it would have killed her. And I knew that I would never tell her. I think by concern 
of course, would have been my family, but also my peers, also people in the bank. If I were in my right mind, and if I were, if I had support of some sort, and it wouldn't have happened that way. But I was alone, and that was the life at the time, and I just had to face it. I felt, looking back on it, that I regret not having had the moral courage to face down society and to do the decent thing and, 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 and uh, get married and, and uh, hold on to our baby. But I just wasn't able to do it. I wasn't able to, uh, I wasn't able to go to Mary and say, listen, we will get married and keep our baby. This is where Mary had her baby 34 years ago, Cork Sacred Heart Convent. It once catered for a hundred unmarried mothers at a time. If a girl got pregnant uh, out of wedlock, this was another mouth to feed. It was also uh, the thinking of society that um, children, that girls, uh, unmarried girls, shouldn't get pregnant, and they were rejected by their parents, by society, uh, by the, the the father who 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 was responsible, and we were here offering a service. Most of the babies dispatched to America by nuns came from just a handful of institutions. 600 or more came from the Sacred Heart homes at Castle Pollard in West Meath, Bessborough in Cork and Sean Ross Abbey in Tipperary. Almost 600 more came from St Patrick's Guild, run by the Sisters of Charity in Dublin, and another 200 from St Clare's Convent in Meath. Single pregnant women would usually go to an institution as far from their home as possible. Secrecy was paramount, but they paid for their sins with hard work in severe surroundings. For the nuns it was a vicious circle. They saw themselves as picking up the pieces of shattered young lives. Others saw them as enforcing moral standards which crushed single mothers and banished their offspring. We did the best we could. Where would they go? Would, they go to, would it be better to be uh, reared in an institution in Ireland or to be placed in loving families in the States? Now, like all human institutions, there were failures, but from what we gather about the children coming back, looking for their origins, they seem to have done very well. The way I felt at the time, I think, was that while well, going to America was good for the child, he was going to get, uh, it, it was developed society, he was going to get a uh, good home. And uh, it was very easy to convince oneself that he was going to get a home better than we would give him. I think I've, led a, I've had a great life and I have wonderful parents here in America. That there is a deep sense of loss. And it's, it's, you know, it's very, very deep inside me. It's, um, you know, as much as my life has been happy, and, 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 and very wonderful. You know, there's, there's, a, there's a sorrow of not knowing where you came from. The flow of Irish babies to America was driven by demand, for there was always a shortage of white children for adoption by middle-class Americans. After World War II, many European orphans were shipped to the States, and in the rush, Ireland was spotted as a place where babies could be obtained easily and exported freely. There were many disturbing stories. In 1949, for example, an American businessman returning from Ireland with two infants told the New York Times he picked them up in the first baby home he visited as a surprise for his wife. The story was flashed across America, further fueling demand for easy-to-get Irish babies. Reading these stories back in Dublin, Archbishop John McQuaid feared Catholic children might fall into the hands of non-Catholic adopters. McQuaid moved to take control. By 1952, when adoption first became legal within Ireland, McQuaid had introduced his own rules governing American adoptions. McQuaid insisted that would-be adopters provide a pastor's recommendation and detailed bankers' and employers' statements. They also needed a home study report from an organisation called Catholic Charities. Archbishop McQuaid insisted that the American adoptions be conducted in total secrecy, and he had a simple message only devout and well-off Catholic couples need apply. 
the couple make a declaration to say that this child, and in some of the uh, states it calls this alien, will not be a burden on the American state. And the couple um, swear that they will uh, educate the child. There is a strong emphasis on the Catholic ethos and that the child will be sent to a Catholic school, to a Catholic university, if it has the ability. And um, there are a number of state, you know, statements of income. Only when McQuaid's requirements were fully satisfied would the Department of External Affairs issue a passport to an infant departing for the States. McQuaid may have wanted to ensure the best for Irish babies, but family faith and fortune didn't always equate with happiness. One of the 2,000 children sent to America under the McQuaid regulations was Maureen McClung. Maureen now lives in suburban Virginia Beach on America's east coast with six children of her own. I was born in Castle Pollard. Uh, my mother was um, involved with a man and they were going out and um, I was conceived and afterwards she found out that he was divorced. and. Um, there was no choice of marrying a divorced man in the time of the church in Ireland. Maureen was sent to New York in 1962 by the nuns at St. Clair's Adoption Society in Meath. Her adoptive parents had satisfied McQuaid's requirements. Yet Maureen's adoptive mother was chronically ill and spent years in a wheelchair while Maureen was growing up. Maureen was also reminded constantly that back in Ireland she'd been an unloved and unwanted baby. And they said, your mother didn't want you. Your mother left you in this place. And so by our good nature, we have taken you and brought you to America. So my first impression was that um, what they kind of portrayed to me was the situation was, and it wasn't really for my adopted father, but more for the adopted mother. This was a terrible thing. These, these, this was an awful thing. You weren't. So what we have done is a wonderful thing for you. So this, be very grateful for it. Um, my parents were very Catholic, very, very Catholic. Yeah, church was a big deal. I went to Catholic school, and so, yeah, that was, it was very Catholic. That was a big, that was more of a big, I knew about the whole Catholic religion more than I did know about anything about Ireland. Catholic Charities USA, Anne speaking, may I help you? Catholic Charities, who vetted Maureen's adoption, is today America's biggest religious-run welfare organization. But in the 50s, Irish officials were skeptical about its ability to handle the Irish adoptions, and even within Catholic Charities itself, there was disquiet. I was very concerned at how serious a matter it was to pluck a child out of Ireland and place him permanently, cut off his roots in Ireland, or her roots in Ireland, and place that child for adoption. That was a fundamental concern of mine and uh, I expressed it very strongly in Catholic Charities USA at the time and uh, had arguments with people in that regard uh, who looked upon it as being somewhat un-American that of course it would be better for a child to be in America than to be in Ireland in the 1950s. The accepted knowledge or acceptant practice at that time would have been possibly that America would have been a good option and therefore for mothers with no other option it might have been seen as positive. But Mary Wilson who works with Sister Sarto at the Sacred Heart Convent in Cork says that not all American adoptions worked out. I presume the mothers would have hoped very sincerely that things would be better for their children. In many cases that may have happened but in many other cases as we know from uh, people coming back, survivors of that system, that it may not have been the case, and that hopes for a new start, fresh start, they were not realized. The Catholic Charities Angel Guardian Home in New York placed almost 300 Irish children for adoption, but Catholic Charities in Miami, under Father Walsh, simply refused to participate in McQuaid's scheme. There's no question that, you know, uh, to the sisters, uh, religious sisters who are running these offerages, the offer of a home in America, you know, where everybody was a millionaire, they thought, uh, was marvelous. Uh, those of us who were in the States, and I've been there and realized that poverty was very endemic in the United States, but I can understand uh, that it must have appeared very attractive 
and that this was the best possible solution. My position was through education and through the provision of proper social services, uh, the solution should be in Ireland. But in Ireland, two questions were being asked. Following newspaper allegations in 1956 about children being sold secretly to America, there were demands in the Dáil for an inquiry. Fianna Fáil TD Donna O'Malley claimed that some Americans were paying £150 to get a child, equivalent to £6,000 in today's money. He wanted to know who's carrying out the deals for these millionaires, semi-millionaires and very high Catholic Americans. But all the government would say was that 500 children had already been sent to the United States under McQuaid's guidelines. O'Malley's call for an investigation was ignored and the matter quickly disappeared again from public view. This was a picture of me and a letter um, saying a baby was available and it was May of 1960 that they mailed to the adopted um, family saying, do you want this baby? From correspondence kept by her adoptive parents in America, Maureen McClung knows that money played a part in her adoption. In fact, her parents, James and Dorothy Reddy, were the first to mention money when they wrote in March 1960, seeking a baby from Sister Mary Dorothea, matron of St. Clair's Adoption Society in Stamullen. They told Sister Mary that the Angel Guardian Home in New York had mentioned the cost involved in getting a child from Ireland but this, they said, was not a problem. For years, the Reddies had been trying without success to adopt in America, and so they were delighted when Sister Mary Dorothea wrote back with details of an Irish baby, available if you would like to have her. They cablegrammed their reply, baby wanted, send soon as possible, love her already. And by return post from Sister Mary, a bill for £50 for expenses, equivalent to £1,800 today, yet unitemized. Maureen's parents subsequently paid another £400 or so, 14000 today, for air tickets and lawyer's bills, and the payments to Stamullen didn't stop with the unitemized expenses. Well, basically, uh, even from talking to my father, they had given donations up to a certain amount a year. Um, he was an engineer, he had a good job, um, they had a nice home. Money was not a problem. They felt that they were doing um, a service to the church. They were doing a wonderful thing. You know, they didn't really research it. See, they didn't really research out, where are these babies, what's going on? They didn't know. They were so glad just to get what they wanted that I shut, but they would always give money. And he said to the, to the orphanage, they would mail checks to the orphanage, here's a gift. Some acknowledgments signed by Sister Mary Dorothea still exist. For example, 10th of November 1960, thank you very much for the $20 which we were so grateful to get. 27th of April 1962, thank you very much indeed for your very generous Easter gift. In addition to donations, money was also solicited. When Maureen was six years old, Sister Mary Aloysius from St. Clair's wrote to her parents, we are very busy trying to build a new wing for all our little darlings. If any of your friends would like to help, we would be more than grateful. It was the kind of request Maureen's father would respond to. I think he thought he was doing a service to the church. I believe in his heart he thought, I'm going to help this. And in gratitude, I'm going to do this. In gratitude. And they were grateful that they did this because they were 40 years old and adoption was shut in America. So to them, they had really did him a favor. The law prohibited adoption societies from charging fees for fear of babies being sold, but ongoing donations were another matter and could have added up to a significant income at a time when $20 went a long way. Certainly, the Sacred Heart Sisters, who sent over 600 children to the States, received donations, but they deny that babies were sold. Well, it was a serious allegation to be made, and we did check it out. We went through all the files. There is no evidence of money being passed. In the letters coming back, there are mention of small donation. I'm enclosing a small donation um, for your society or for your organization. To my knowledge, there was no fees involved. And I've, we have checked it with anybody who is now, who's still alive and was involved with it. Is that Tony? 
33 years after leaving Ireland, Kevin Bates has finally been reunited with Mary and Michael Geraghty. Finding each other wasn't easy, and when they did, the joy on both sides was tinged with new sorrows. For the first time, Kevin found out that his natural parents had married and had six more children, while he had been brought up the only child of an American couple who divorced. At the same time, Michael and Mary learned to their astonishment that Kevin hadn't been sent to America until a full year after their marriage, contrary to their belief at the time. My feeling uh, at the time was that he was going straight to America within days. That was my belief at the time, that they told me that he was going straight to America. And I rel relinquished all rights to see my child again. And you know, I just knew he was gone, or believed that he was gone immediately. I mean, it was, a, it, was a, it was a shock to hear that he was 22 months, or 20 months, in Dublin. And more of a shock to know that we were married, and he's still here, in Ireland. I, I wonder, you know, I, I kind of wonder how did it all ha why did they, after having, having been given birth, and then relinquishing me, there they were in Ireland. They were in Ireland, um, and they eventually married. It's amazing that they. I wasn't in that family. I mean, it's it's and I'm. They're, they're amazed like I am that, that that I was basically sent off to America. And amazing it was, for in 1963, when Kevin left Ireland, only illegitimate children could be sent abroad for adoption. But Mary and Michael's marriage had legitimised Kevin's birth long before St. Patrick's Guild sent him to America. No one has been asked to explain. And Mary has no recollection of signing any documents, but she probably signed a form like this, giving guardianship of her child to a nun to enable her to make the child available for adoption to any person she considered fit and proper, inside or outside the state. The question of maternal consent was another cause of concern. We had no means in an agency like ours of being assured that there had been proper surrender papers, that the full freedom uh, that the mother knew and even the father knew what they were doing in surrendering the children for adoption. And this was a very fundamental concern. I blanked out everything except handing my child over to a nun. I remember nothing about who's there, or whether I signed anything. I don't remember signing any papers. But my feeling was that my child was going to America immediately. I was, I was led to believe that. My, my condition was just so, um, I was so traumatized that I blanked out everything. Hello, it's Kevin. If Kevin's departure for America had been kept from Mary and Michael, history repeated itself when Kevin returned in 1991 looking for Mary Cunningham. Although most of the trip was a vacation, uh, I did get a chance to, uh, one day to visit with uh, Sister Gabriel at St. Patrick's Guild in Dublin. It was perhaps a 20-minute meeting, and I asked her if uh, she knew the whereabouts of Mary, and she said she wasn't able to, she did not know where Mary was. And um, before leaving, I asked her, I gave her my forwarding address, said that I would be going back to America, and I asked her to, to, to contact me in the event that she did get in touch with Mary. And I can't understand why I wasn't contacted, regardless of the consequences. I mean, he needed to know, and I think he had the right to know, regardless of what my uh, experience was. After all, I had given birth to him. He wanted to know his roots. He was in pain, I think. In 1994, Mary and Michael also contacted Sister Gabriel at St. Patrick's Guild in Dublin. They were looking for their son, Kenneth Cunningham. Sister Gabriel revealed that he'd been to see her, but said little else. I went up there looking for Kenneth. And I, I asked her, what was his name? Oh, well, I can't give you that. And uh, I said, didn't you leave his name and address with you? 
And she said, he did, but I can't give you that. I found that very diff difficult to accept, that here she was, sitting in front of us with his name and address, and she would give us that. Obviously, rules, she was sticking to some rules that she must have had. In fact, Sister Gabriel wrote to Kevin, but he had moved. She promised to pray, but still there was no progress. My feeling was of devastation and frustration and angry that I wasn't getting anywhere. And here was my son looking for me. Here was I looking for him. We both wanted to meet. There was no secrecy anymore. And nothing was being done. Sister Gabriel declined to be interviewed for this program, but in a statement she said it was the policy of St. Patrick's Guild to help adoptees and birth mothers. Long delays, she said, were inevitable without more funds. She said that the only children sent to America were those whose mothers had made definite decisions against reclaiming them. There had been 113 tracing requests from the American adoptions and 12 reunions had been arranged. But Kevin and his parents weren't among them. Deeply frustrated, Mary and Michael made contact with a voluntary organisation that helps trace relatives. By chance, Kevin contacted the same organisation. I talked to this woman early in the morning and she said that she had found my birth mother, Mary. And she said, you better be sitting down because your birth mother married your father. And then they had a family. They have four brothers, she said, four brothers two sisters, a dozen aunts and uncles, 30-something first cousins, and they're all over in Ireland, and they can't wait to meet you. And I was, I was, you know, obviously I was shocked. I was uh, as happy as a, as a person can be in, in a moment, and, and very, just over, over, just overjoyed and very emotional. And, uh, that was in the, mor the morning that, that I talked with this woman, and it was later that evening that uh, Mary called me. I was here and waiting until 11 at night, so half 11 at night, and actually Michael had given up hope on me ringing, and he was going to go to bed. And we were waiting to see my move. Anyway, I went in, and my Evelyn, or Vanessa, my daughter, came in with me, and I made the phone call. And, uh, Kevin answered, and I said, this is your mother. And he said, I don't believe it. And I said, well, is it, you know, we started talking then. And he was talking about, I actually don't, I can't tell you exactly what was said, because it was emotional. And it was such a relief. And from his end, you could feel the same picked up the phone, and she introduced herself as Mary. Hi, this is Mary. This is your mom. How have you been? And I, we, I, although I had, I, all the tears had flown earlier that morning, I, I was choking up inside. I didn't know what, you know, how, what do you say to, what do you say to your other mother? after all these years and and what do you say? I never really really imagined that I would ever find her and on top of all this to find that that I had a a, a father and a family Maureen McClung was also to have a happy and emotional reunion with her birth mother after a long and frustrating search for years Maureen was in contact with a priest in Castle Pollard who had her birth records unaware that her mother was contacting the same priest but there was no match. How I felt like was like, there's, I'm 36 years old, I'm an adult, have six children. They are still making my decisions for me. They made that decision to send me where they're going to, you know. And even now as an adult coming back, they still feel like they're going to make those decisions for me. And part of me was kind of upsetting because I felt I'm not a child. I, don't like, I didn't like being treated that way. I mean, it's more frustrating when you go to the church and keep asking for information, when you know that the church has all the information, they have your files sitting right in front of him, and he won't, op he won't tell you anything, that's very frustrating and very hard. 
When Maureen finally found her birth mother with little help from church or state, a heavy burden was lifted from her shoulders. All my life, the way it was presented to me was, well, you weren't wanted, you were abandoned. You carried all your life thinking, I was abandoned, I wasn't wanted. And to find out the truth was like having a bouquet of flowers handed to you. No, you were wanted. No, your, your father even wanted to take you. No, you weren't just something that was just left. So it's like suddenly, um, 30 something years of thinking one way, it's like, no, it wasn't like this. And it's just, you're even your, there's a boost on your self esteem and, and an understanding that in your own life, you carried a baggage you didn't have to carry. Other adoptees have not been as lucky as Maureen and Kevin. Many can't trace their roots because their birth certificates were falsified to shield their mother's true identities, but the practice of falsifying records was known about officially. In 1965, Mary Keating of St Rita's Maternity Home in Dublin was prosecuted for forging a birth certificate. The false documents suggested that an Irish baby was the natural child of an American couple who had taken the baby to the States. This was a very serious offence, but Mrs Keating was only put on probation and allowed to keep her license. In another case, a child was issued with a passport, even though its mother stated in an affidavit that the birth certificate was false. It's nothing less than a national scandal that this should have happened. And I suppose there are people still in control who were in control at that time when these things took place, I don't know, but uh, if I'm to believe what I read, it's, it's a terrible business. I mean, imagine, imagine in our situation, if we were looking for Kevin and that his passport and, and, and uh, birth certificate were forged, I got to be up the wall. Frantic. I mean, what can one do? The past secrets of many saddened lives are lodged in these 600 American adoption files, mostly from the 50s and 60s. Now in the hands of Sister Sarto and Cork, the files come from all three Sacred Heart homes around the country. Sister Sarto has already had 300 American adoption inquiries. I think it's a right of every individual to know their, their, their background. And uh, we have, in any way we can, uh, to put people in contact with their their parent of origin. I would be totally in favour of a contact register and I would, I would um, hope that it would be in a, in a statutory agency. But the statutory agency may use us and use our services. The files that we have here are confidential to us. Um, and if the statutory agency, uh, like the Adoption Board, need to use us because we act for the Adoption Board, um, then we'd be only too willing to help. The revelation of 2,000 duplicate personal case files in state archives might have opened up greater access to this jealously guarded information. But official procedure is to refer all inquiries back to the nuns. I mean, there should be a policy. I mean, the government should have a policy on this. And all these uh, files should be coordinated. And, you know, it's, it's uh, something serious has to be done. you got to ask yourself and you got to ask others how is there a better way that the system can work where if a natural child wants to meet their natural parents and vice versa how can they go about finding each other without a lot of bureaucracy and a lot of questions unanswered I'm just one person that searched and found and there must be hundreds maybe thousands of, of kids like me looking for the natural parents. There seems to be a lot of holding back or covering up or um, putting the, like I've heard now that the files are not going to be uh, let out. And what is that going to be like for, for these mothers or adopted children? It's the adopted children really. They're so anxious to contact, get the roots and that they're be being prevented from doing this. And we've moved into a different age. Surely now, let everything come out into the open. And I'll be coming in 20 years' time and, and saying, yes, it should have come out. 
For a society pledged to cherish all its children equally, Ireland has fallen short. In the rush to judge others for their sexual transgressions, the most vulnerable often paid the heaviest price. Those who sent 2,000 Irish infants across the Atlantic may have assumed they would never come back, but they were wrong. For everyone involved, it can only be hoped there will be more openness in the future than there was in the past. And people that aren't adopted don't understand, because my husband will say, just don't worry about it. You're so, you know, you're so blessed, you're so blessed. Don't worry about it. But it's something that's always, it's like a missing piece. It's like doing a puzzle and you're missing that one piece. and It's, it's a part of your life and you need to know. I think the, uh, uh, me and many other adopted people are on a journey. I think we all have different roads. My journey was to find my natural parents. To, and my goal was to fill that void inside my heart. I'm sure that our mothers, all mothers that have given up a child for adoption, are aching that part of their heart is gone like mine was. And if their child is trying to contact them, or if they are thinking they should go, that there are means and ways of doing it secretly. I be, I've heard that, and I believe that. And they should go and tell that child, I gave you up out of love, and I still love you. We are the lucky ones. How many mothers are out there wondering where their child is?